Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm just gonna go ahead and start, start again. Uh, welcome to the November 1st. Are we getting feedback? Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so welcome to the Mono Basin Historical Society November meeting. We're doing this in person and Zoom. Uh, we were having uh, some sound difficulties, but I think we're all good now. And um, we are con going to continue the Zoom meetings because our out of town folks really, really appreciate being able to attend the meetings and presentations when they're not here in town. Uh, for those in-town folks, if you'd like to come and join us, it would be lovely to be able to spend some time together. And uh, we have the potluck, and uh, we can discuss maybe a little bit more business if we have a few, few more folks here. So um, we'd sure appreciate it if you'd come on down to the community center. All righty. So, um, oh, and what we are going to do for the folks that uh, are here tonight, we are going to do a, um, a drawing for a door prize for a David Carl book. So those of you that are not here, that's what you're missing out on, as well as a really tasty potluck. So, okay, um, as far as announcements goes, uh, trustees. It's that time of year that trustees are up for re-election. And this year, the, the trustees that terms will be expiring in January are Margie Beaver, Rich Foy, Barry McPherson, and Dave Swisher. Rich and Barry have offered to run for re-election, and Margie and Dave have decided to step down for a bit to, to many other commitments. I asked for, me for nominations in our meeting announcement, and so far have received two nominations. I have yet to confirm with both nominees that, are they, that they are willing to serve on the Board of Trustees. Once confirmed, we'll put together a ballot and send it out with the uh, Fall 2021 newsletter. If you would like to volunteer to be a trustee or have someone to nominate, please let me know. Okay, that's that. And I wanted to also let everyone know that uh, uh, we have an open museum manager position. After, I believe, three years of service to the MBHS as a museum manager, John Wardicke moved on to other life adventures. Uh, we manned the museum mostly with volunteer docents this year, and we were able to keep the museum open five days per week throughout the season. If you or if you know of someone that would be interested in working at the museum as a museum manager next season, and the season is Memorial Day weekend through the last weekend in September, please email our curator at monobasinhistory.org or give me a call. Um, we don't pay much, but it's a great place to work. And you get to meet a lot of interesting people and generally talk about what a great place the Mono Basin is. So if you know of anybody or if you'd like to do this, we'd sure appreciate it. Uh, the other uh, volunteer position that we have open is our membership co coordinator. Uh, so we're looking for someone to volunteer to be the membership coordinator. And uh, this entails adding new memberships to our member list, uh, assist with sending the yearly newsletter. And um, the, at the yearly newsletter uh, has our membership renewal form in, in the newsletter and then any follow-up that is needed on membership throughout the year. Okay, it's time to talk about decorating the upside down house. Yay! So we need to pick a date to decorate our, I know it's hard to think about Christmas. We just handed out Halloween candy. Well, that's what I was thinking is before Christmas, actually we could, you know, Thanksgiving week is just too busy. So we could do it like the week before Thanksgiving or the week after Thanksgiving. Okay, I'm hearing week after. Sound good? Uh, during the week or on the weekend? Yeah. Yeah, it just takes a, a couple of hours. Yeah, it's really fun to put all the decorations upside down. <laughs> uh, if it would be really neat, maybe we need a Santa that we could hang by his feet. Okay. 
Okay. So what uh, what we just heard is that we'll go for a weekday, the week after Thanksgiving. I'll send it out once we firm up a complete date. Um, and then it usually takes us about a couple of hours. It's just a fun activity. And it's, it's always fun to see the upside down house decorated upside down. Uh, so many people in the uh, that visited this summer, they would even say that they saw pictures of the upside down house decorated and how it, it made them happy to see the upside down decorations. Uh, one of the things that uh, was a big hit at the upside down house this year is as parents were taking pictures of their kids, they would flip them so that the child look was upside down and everything in the house was right side up and, uh, and they really liked that the kids thought it was really great and then the parents were sending them off to grandma and grandpa's right away so it's pretty cool so um next month at the december meeting uh, we're going to have uh, chris lisa is going to do the treasurer's report and um and then also uh, we're going to start bringing back the meeting notes reading because Duncan and Ellen do such a wonderful job of taking the notes and they make them sound so much fun when they read them back to us. So, uh, so that'll be coming next month. And our events, uh, December, or, or our, our presentations, in December, we've got uh, Lundy, California, Life in a Mining Town from 1880 to 1914, and that's going to be presented by Linda LaPierre. In February, Barry McPherson is going to do uh, Broken Dreams, uh, W.D. McPherson, and it's going to be a reprisal, and are you adding more to it from the... Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so Barry is going to be, uh, this was a presentation that he gave at our ghost tour dinner. And, uh, but now because we're here, well, we're going to be able to have uh, pictures that he's going to have to share with us, as well as some new information. Uh, we are going to go dark in January and skip a meeting. It's usually a pretty cold month and uh, we thought we would just take a month off. So there will not be a January meeting. And then we still have some holes to fill, but so far for next year, in April, we have Cole Hawkins. And if Cole, if Cole is on, uh, do you have a title for your talk? We're looking. Ah, okay. Well, when we find out what the name of the talk is, we'll let everybody know. And then uh, in May, David Woodruff is going to give us another tale along 395, and those are always fun. And then sometime in the fall, maybe October, Hillary Hansen Jones uh, and, um, and some her, her family members, and uh, in case you folks don't know, Hillary is the new owner of the Mono Inn. And uh, they're going to talk about Pop Miller. And we don't have a firm month set yet, but we're looking at maybe October. Maybe at, the, oh, she said she really wanted to be able to do it at the Mono Inn. So that would be fun. That would be fun. So that is what I've got. Does anybody else have anything? Oh, well, I'm with you. We were going to do a sing-along. Barry said he's out, and I'm a horrible singer, so I'm out. So I think we're down to Dave and Janet. No, no. You guys could do a duo. <laughs> yeah. Well, I... We... I said approximately 6.30. So how many folks do we have in now? Look at all these folks. Let's see. Hello, Kathy DeBall. Pat Ratowski. Pat's in somewhere on the Central Coast. 
Rhonda and Hank. Jenny Hanna. Oh, that sounds like a great thing. So the folks that are on Zoom, how many of you would be willing to do a program for us? And you could even do it on Zoom if you would like. Raise your hand. Um, <laughs> unmute. We'll jump up and down and be so happy. I see Nora's dad is there. Let's see. Joanne Hine is there. Joanne, you could give us a presentation with your beautiful photographs. Yeah. <laughs> of historic sites. There. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, well, I don't see anyone. Is, is anyone waving? Okay, darn. They're, okay, we're sure that this takes some deep thought. So, <laughs> and uh, so uh, if you think of something that you would yeah. like to give us a presentation about, please let us know. Email, call, carrier well, pigeon, anything. So let's see, it's uh, 620, and I did say we're gonna start approximately 630. So we might take what, maybe a five minute break? Robin, Steve. Let's do a five minute break, and then we'll come back. I'm, so I'm just gonna turn the microphone <laughs> off for a little bit. <laughs> I was just gonna say that uh, I could give a program by Zoom, but it probably wouldn't have much to do about the Mono Basin. I just wanna <laughs> share that. Yay, Steve Moore. We just saw your chat where you would be interested. So we will be reaching out to you uh, about working at Bodie in the 70s. Now, uh, Dave, are you old enough to know Steve Moore? Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So now let's see. We are, oh, while we were on our break, we've talked about possibly three other folks that we might be able to get to give uh, presentations. So we have four slots. So other than Steve, anybody wants to raise their hand, we'd sure appreciate it. And thank you so much, Steve. And we will be reaching out to you. Yeah, we'll have to, I, I didn't see him on the chat, but we'll be reaching out to Bob Marks too. Oh, March. Oh, Steve Moore. How about March? Let's see. We'll, uh, we'll talk to him that tomorrow. That could be, that could be a possibility. I, my calendar in my head doesn't go anywhere near that Steve, could you put part. your email address in the, uh, in the chat? So we've got oh, it? Okay. okay. I will do so. All righty. So now we are going to go to our presentation. Uh, Chris Spiller is going to give this to us, the energetic and amazing McTarnahan. Chris is an awesome speaker. She works at Bodie, Chris. She works for the Bodie Foundation, and uh, she is also one of our trustees of this historical society, and we greatly appreciate her. So here we go, Chris. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and it's great to be here as usual. Um, great group of people here that love history and urge you to join them. And uh, as a lot of you know, I, I work for the Bodie Foundation. I do a lot of social media, and uh, I do a thing called Throwback Thursday. And for those of you who don't know, the Bodie Foundation is a fundraising organization for three parks, uh, Grover, Hot Springs up near Markleyville, um, Mono Lake and the Tufa State Natural Reserve. And of course, Bodie is part of our name. So I do social media for both Mono Lake and Bodie, the Friends of Mono Lake page. And I like to do the throwback Thursdays and always looking for um, people to submit things. So please, um, Chris at BodieFoundation.org if you have a good history story. And as you can imagine, I don't always get a lot of submissions and uh, some of these looking, scouring old newspapers. Well, one day 
I find this guy named McTarnahan in a story about the Mono Basin, and he, he's called a rancher. And I think this is very interesting, and uh, but improbable. And you'll you'll see what I'm talking about when we get into the story, because he was a lot of other places besides the Mono Basin. And I ran the story and didn't think too much more about him. And then I ran across him in a couple other books. And I went, hmm, I wonder if somewhere down the line this guy would make a good program. Well, finally one day when I got a break from my normal job, I uh, searched for him on newspapers, historic newspaper sites. And one was the Library of Congress. And basically my head snapped back when I got that many hits. Probably a lot of you do genealogy and you're looking for your relatives on newspapers, sites, and you'll get, oh, maybe a few things if you're lucky. Well, I was sort of amazed how many newspaper articles, and that's kind of what we're going to see tonight. Uh, I have one picture of him, which is right here, and uh, tried to illustrate with these newspaper articles. So just imagine that your life is being told through newspaper articles of the Old West, basically. <laughs> So some of these uh, articles, I think, are a little tongue-in-cheek, but we're going to dive down the rabbit hole and uh, learn about the energetic and amazing McTarnahan. And as you can see, he's had a lot of different careers, so that's sort of our sub-theme here. This guy did almost everything and went a lot of places. So here we go. Oh. Sorry to... Too, too impatient. And he was born in Ohio in what I've just learned is Peak Way. Hopefully I'm saying that right. I apologize to all the people in Ohio, but I looked it up this afternoon. And uh, to Francis, Rachel Connolly, were his McTarnahan were his parents. And he had a younger brother, Isaac, and a sister, Margaret. And this is the earliest picture I could find of the town. What's really unique is those buildings, for the most part, are still there. And he didn't stay in Ohio. He came west with a lot of other people, close to 100,000 others, to look for gold. We don't have any stories of how well he did, but he's doing well enough that he settles in California and he gets married. And he marries Catherine Jane Miller in 1852. And his wife, Catherine, however, sadly dies almost a year after the birth of their son, John Clark McTarnahan. In 1859, he's still in El Dorado County, and he remarries. Lovely lady named Sarah Carolyn Hart. And children soon arrive, but many die young. Okay, first career, he launches into politics. The first reference I found of him was a grand jury foreman in El Dorado County. But that's not enough. He's now going to take uh, a job as a supervisor. So he runs for office and serves from 1863 till 1866. And what does he do after that? Well, he's working at a quartz mill 100 miles south in Tuolumne County, the Columbus Quartz Mill. And then it seems to be He's on the move. And then the next three children are born farther north, including his daughter, Carrie. And uh, she's up in Truckee, California. Another son is born there. And his last child was Sarah, is born in 1877 in Carson City, Nevada. And he has more plans to be political. He's running for office, state senator. He's not starting small. So he announces his candidacy. And I just love his slogan here. Um, independent in everything, neutral in nothing, unpledged to men or parties. And it's interesting slogan, but I don't think people were too enthusiastic about it. Sorry. You can't lean on that. OK. So his slogan led to this less enthusiastic notice from the local paper. Because uh, he, he got started early, but Mr. McConaughey ought to succeed, you know, starting early is in his favor. 
The aspirin is a Democrat, we believe, and as such will be likely to draw the greater part of his strength from the party with whose organization he has so long been identified. We believe he has been vaccinated. Does anybody know what that means? I do not, but that's just one of the funny little things that come along down the rabbit hole. And he didn't, he didn't win a seat, but that doesn't stop him. Never mind the election. He's going to cure people of scarlet fever. And uh, he claims that he has used this for his children and friends. And before you look at the correct version, there, apparently there was a mistake in one of the other papers. And the, uh, they had to quickly do a little uh, correction. Ounces were mentioned instead of grains, and if anyone has used the recipe for the cure of the disease, they have by this time effectually cured their patient or patients, as the dose mentioned would kill a horse or the oldest, most stubborn mule that ever traveled on four legs. We trust no untoward circumstance has occurred from Mr. McTarnahan's mistake, Carson Tribune. But I find the actual recipe horrifying enough. Uh, five grains of sulfate of zinc, uh, foxglove, isn't that poisonous? Okay, and some uses. Yeah, I guess that's used in digitalis. White sugar, water, that's, that's okay. And uh, yeah, soft water. And for sore mouth, use a mixture of made of honey, gunpowder, and burnt alum. I guess that's because maybe you get a sore mouth from taking that. I, I hadn't figured that out yet. Okay, well, you can at least help build the state capitol if you're not going to work in the building. So he, by April 1875, McTarnahan has a contract for plowing up, leveling the plaza, hauling in the dirt, dumping it around the capitol building so the ground will slope away from it. And uh, the article says that the work is going well and that Mac is an indefatigable worker. And he also is in the wood business. And I had to look this up. Um, Ash Canyon is west of Carson City and looks like a hiking trail there now, but he was uh, fluing it down the canyon and uh, doing pretty well. And he has 60 minute work, says the article. And this year he will not be caught unprepared for a storm. Apparently he had been caught in a storm a year to the day that he was working up there. So now he's got enough money to purchase a ranch in Smith Valley. And from sound of this reporter, great accomplishments by McTarnahan seem to be expected. And I think you can read this pretty well, but he's off for his ranch in Walker River Valley very soon. Must be stormy, that same John. He will make things lively on that walker and like as not, found a new city thereabout after the manner of Romulus and Remus. And there are some cities named Rome, aren't there? So promising developments in mining occur southeast of Carson City, and a committee is formed to examine routes for a road between Carson City and Columbus, Nevada. And you can see that they're at the district courtroom selecting a committee to examine the routes proposed by Mr. McTarnahan for a Columbus and Carson wagon road. So a little background on Columbus. It was in Esmeralda County to the south of Carson City, founded in 1865 by silver miners, but a supply of salt was discovered. And by 1866, the population had grown to 200. And then borax was discovered by 1871. And by 1873, there are several companies at work. And so you soon, by the time um, they're talking about this, they have a school, post office, iron foundry, and a weekly newspaper as what happens with most towns like this, it was abandoned by the mid 1880s. So people really want this road, at least the media does. And I just pulled a quote out that's just really amusing. Um, Mac was willing to forego all directorship and superintendency if the funds for the purpose could be raised. We would like to see the coin furnished and Mac made emperor of the road. Esmeralda County now produces half a million a month in bullion. So you can see why people were so eager. And 
we hope our leading property owners will be present such action taken as shall ensure the completion of this road so you see they're having another meeting it's advertised in the paper now my problem with doing the research on mr mccarnahan is i didn't really know where the road was this is the best approximation this is from a nevada uh, state sign and they talk about the 12 mile house and uh you can see that uh, it goes all the way down to as far as Aurora. However, as we see later on, he, he had another toll road too. And there's also a lot of discussion in the media, and we would be here two hours if I brought all these articles to you, but there seems to be another toll road that was gonna go southeast mostly, but it would go first through Dayton. And apparently the Dayton people got very upset. They didn't want this road and I, just kind of had to pick and choose here, but um, I think this road got built from what I can tell from other references. As you see, they say whether the route is in all respects is as desirable as the old one. So maybe there was another one. And sadly, his wife, Sarah Caroline Hart, dies December 3rd, 1878. And this is basically just a couple of different death notices from the Carson paper. And uh, you see that they're copying to other areas who would be interested, where maybe McTarnahan has been, and I haven't found out yet about that. He leaves a, seven children and her loving husband to mourn her loss. 11 days after the death of his wife, McTarnahan leases his toll road. Not the one we were talking about apparently not because you can see this runs from junction house which anyone who knows where that is help me but i think it's up closer to reno through coal valley and I, and that is still around i think it's a ghost town but it's closer to highway six as you're going out toward tonopah so he's leased this out and then in april 1880 this interesting little notice appears but there's no follow-up to this. Apparently, um, we still have Ormsby County commissioners. And of course, Ormsby County sort of went away um, because it just became part of the municipality of Carson City. And uh, you can see he's trying to sell a bridge. I've got a bridge you, you can buy, yeah. Um, this is McTarnahan Bridge, more about that later. But this was probably built in association with his uh, toll road. And so you see, they didn't vote on it. And I wonder, well, why would he be selling this? And when you start putting things in date order, things get very interesting. McTarnahan has a new project. Guess what it is? It's a railroad. It's the Nevada, California, Oregon Railway, a three foot narrow gauge railroad. And we, they were going to connect Reno with the Columbia River. Only 238 miles wherever delayed though. And the track uh, ended at Lakeview, Oregon. And because of the company's reputation for mismanagement, it was often called, and I think, I believe a Sparks Museum wrote this little article about this, the narrow crooked and ornery railroad. And as you see, if you're reading ahead up on these, there was also a plan for the rail line to be built not only north, but south toward Roar Bodie. And I just love the article on the left where they're talking about we have been virtuous and we are correspondingly happy. They're so thrilled. We're gonna have a, a railroad. And you can see McCarnahan listed as one of the officers, both references here. And then I just stumbled across this about a week ago. His name was misspelled, but it's him. He shows up in Bodie, standing on a soapbox. Yes, they really did that and talking to people on the street about the railroad. And so according to the book by uh, Warren Luce, Bodie Bonanza, one evening after McTrenahan had finished his address on the projected railroad between here and Reno, the stand was replaced by a slightly tight individual, that means drunk, uh, who attempted to refute all the previous speaker had said, but before he could state his views on the monopolies, railroads especially, somebody kicked the box out from under him. That's Bodie for you. Okay, back to politics. 
McTarnahan marries for the third time to Miriam Webster, age 52. She dies in 1880, just six months after their marriage. And then near the end of the year, he's nominated as a presidential elector for the Democratic Party. And he's living in Esmeralda County at this time. I was trying to keep track of all the counties he bounced around to, I think at least four. And so you see Winfred Hancock is running for president and the national ticket is listed in the newspaper. And we see our friend McTarnahan right there near the bottom. And one thing he was, was a great speaker. And he uh, is mentioned, I would just read you, I know it's hard to read on some of these. In one review of the Democratic rally, McTarnahan occupied an hour and a half in his address. His manner of talking and his choice of subjects pleased and suited his hearers. His earnest manner and forcible language almost carried conviction to everyone present. His speech was continually applauded, although there were a great many Republicans among the audience. And the other article says, Mr. McTarnahan spoke with his usual honesty of purpose. Oops, I think I went ahead. Nope, good. And now he's back in Bodie and it's interesting because he's called as a prom called a prominent Bodieite, and there's some wonderful references that Bodie was never very political. I mean, they'd go listen to speakers and everything, but they did get um, upset about the Irish, especially the Irish American Bodieites, and they had a local chapter of the Land League of Ireland, which was devoted to placing the Irish tenant back in possession of the land which rightfully belongs to him. And there's a note in the paper that the Land League in Bodie was established on Wednesday evening of 22nd December, 1880. Featured speakers included the chapter presidents and who would you see at the bottom? Mr. McTarnahan. And he's now moving a little farther south. He's starting to venture into Mono County. He's been kept busy working at his uh, gravel mine in Lundy Canyon. I guess you all know where that is. And uh, the article is a very bad type, so I'm going to read a little bit of it for you. Uh, this may be a bit tongue in cheek, but I'll let you decide that. When J.C. McTarnahan of this city started out to prospect his gravel mine at Lundy District, his capital had diminished to 40 cents. With that microscopic capital, he hired a lot of men to work for him, got trusted for nearly 100,000 feet of lumber and enough provisions to board his men for several months, all upon his promise to pay when they took the money out of the ground. Mr. McTarnahan will realize from his mind before the end of year, $1,000 for every cent he had when he started to work his claim. He is undoubtedly one of the best rustlers in the country. And you can see where I got part of the title. Uh, the title of this little article is An Energetic Man. I think we've already figured that out. And he marries for the fourth and final time to Adeline Chamberlain. And of course, the newspapers take note in these articles in 1882. And uh, this, um, he's the fourth time that Mr. McTarnahan has put his head into the matrimonial yoke three of his wives being dead. His former domestic experiences must have been of a decidedly pleasant nature to stimulate him to a fourth venture. He's like the darling of the media, I tell you that. And again, here's another person, it's probably the same people that wrote the other article, Mac is a rustler. When he undertakes anything, it goes with a vim. While he was away, he made the acquaintance of Miss Addie Chamberlain of San Jose and concluded he wanted to marry. With his usually go ahead of this, he told Miss C what he wanted. Yes, was her answer, and Mac is working double now. He feels satisfied with the choice he has made. All right. Well, she's the mom of the seven children now. She, they're on, they left Carson yesterday for Dogtown, Mono District, where he's engaged in hydraulic mining. And here they mistakenly refer to him as a former member of the Nevada legislature. I had did a lot of research and went through all the uh, listings for former senators. He's not there. So 
and they made a mistake. So he's hider looking at Dogtown Gulch hydraulic mining. And the old Mono diggings were the ground in 1861 too was very rich in places. And uh, he will be working down there until winter compels him to examine the work. He has a long flume already constructed. An unlimited supply of water from Green Creek is ready to be turned on. 20 men employed night and day on the bank of gravel 12 to 20 feet high. So we'll see how that works out. Okay, now he's living in Bridgeport. And uh, he shows up on the boating records there, age 54. Um, he has a son who's born in Bridgeport and another son who ends up being born back in Nevada. So I think what's happening here is he's got a winter residence, he's got a summer residence. So that's why he's bouncing back and forth. Oh, I forgot to tell you about his other career. He was a post postal carrier. And this was actually one of my throwback Thursdays. That's the, that's the second reference I found to him. Um, they had a big storm in 1884. Eight feet of snow collapsed awnings and buildings. But despite it all, the mail got through, carried by you know who, McTarnahan. J.C. McTarnahan, the mail carrier, had a hard time coming in from Bridgeport on snowshoes. He was caught in the storm at the present intersection of Bodie Road and Highway 395. It took him 14 hours to snowshoe from there to Bodie. A man of less nerve and determination would have perished, reported the local newspaper. And thank you to the Nay family for that picture. I just rediscovered that the other day and it fit perfect. Okay, and then I just found this out a while back during the summer. Um, then he decides to buy Buckeye Hot Springs. I think we all know where that is, north of Bridgeport. And with another gentleman, Mr. Severe. And they erect a bathhouse. And the note in the uh, Mono Diggings book by Frank S. Wetterts is that in the summer of 1885, the springs were a popular spot for camping, bathing, and fishing. And he's also acquiring some land in Mono Basin. This is where I first met Mr. McTarnahan, the article that's coming up. According to the 1884 article, McTarnahan acquired 320 acres of government land, which I'm guessing was under the Desert Land Act of 1877. So a settler could acquire up to 640 acres of un unirrigated land as long as they filed a declaration of intent to irrigate it within three years and paid 25 cents an acre. Not bad. And um, actually, the article mentions that it was near the mouth of Levining Creek. So uh, you see there's lots of sagebrush there. That's, that's the key word there, okay? Just remember that. And what did he plan to grow? According to the article in the Bodie Free Press, reprinted by the San Francisco Chronicle, he may have been growing grapes. And he wanted to save the uh, world from a very deadly disease caught, carried by plant mice and uh, Phylloxpera. And I probably will mangle that name a couple times, but there's a little better explanation. Plant lice that nearly ended the pleasure of drinking wine worldwide. Uh, early French colonists brought their vines, the European species, found out they didn't do too well. So they uh, started grafting with American vines. And then they said, hey, that's, that works pretty good. So they started importing American vines. And that's when the trouble started. A tiny bug hitched a ride to Europe. And by the mid 1860s, vineyards in France are in trouble. And Phylloxpera was found in vineyards near Sonoma, California in 1874 and spread all over California by 1900. But never fear, McTarnahan will save us. All right, so I'm gonna read a little bit of this. Let me start, it. Well, let me start over here. It's been left for a mono rancher to find a remedy. For two or three years past, J.C. McTarnahan is experimenting with a view to discovering some means of preventing the annual replications of 
phylloxera, I think is the best way to pronounce it, upon grapevines, and he thinks he struck it at last. And some of you that can read that, um, it is his theory that the grapevines and sagebrush are very closely related. And he's going to try to graft them. And uh, so many of his friends wondered why he secluded himself in the desert waste at the mouth of Levining Creek on the dreary shores of desolate Mono Lake. But they now begin to see the old man's head is clear. So uh, no doubt he will astonish the country next summer. But there's never any, any follow up on this. By 1892, he's, he's voting in Santa Rosa, California. This is a bit of a mystery because I think his family is already in Sonora. Um, it's listed as a civil engineer. And during this time, I even find an article that said that he's um, on his way to Alaska, that he's going to run for surveyor general. And I could find nothing else that show that he was successful or if he even went to Alaska. So I kind of had to leave that. I also had to be very careful because his son, John Clark McTarnahan, who gets referred to as JC too, I was going, maybe I'm finding stuff that's the son. So I was pretty careful what I chose. But um, this is pretty clear that this is him here on hit because we, he's born in Ohio and we have a description of him. Um, fair skinned, blue eyes, gray hair, his left thumb is crippled. Maybe that's from trying to graft. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, who knows? And he passes away in 1895. And he's uh, got kind of a, a legacy. He's... Uh, these are only a few of the obituaries that showed up. Um, you see here from Nevada, White Pine News, they're calling him a prominent resident of Nevada in 1868, residing in Washoe County, again, another county, um, and mentions his uh, political career as it was, as temporary elector. And uh, here in the other one, they, he made his hometown newspaper and learned the tannery business during the gold fever. He went to California to seek his fortune. And he was a devout Christian being a lifelong member of the Methodist Church. OK, so what's his legacy? I'm going to very quickly read you this uh, excerpt from the Bridgeport newspaper. Um, these newspapers are very hard to read online. So it took a while to transcribe it. But um, the Bridgeport paper just thinks he's wonderful. Mr. McTardahan was formerly a resident of Bridgeport and leaves many old friends here who will regret to hear of his departure. He was a man of generous impulses. He was a surveyor and helped build some of the railroads of this state on which he had contracts. It was his ambition to assist in the building of a transcontinental line through Mono County and the Sonora Pass, which he considered the nearest and best route from Salt Lake to San Francisco. But his ambition could not be gratified. We cannot think the world has been any worse for having John C. McTarnahan in it. He was a good man, and our people will long remember him. And you can tell that this was this summer because um, I could not even see McTarnahan Hill. I have a picture of it in the next slide. But this is the site of McTarnahan's bridge. And it took a lot of digging, but I finally found out that it washed away in a big flood. In, Carson City in 1907. And uh, from what I can tell, this road is part of his old toll road. And it's kind of on the east side of the Carson River. And there is the actual hill that's named after him. Um, couldn't find out a lot about how it all got named for him. I wonder if he named it after himself. He may have had some mining interests. There's some tungsten mines around there. And today it's a popular hiking spot and a very nice view from the summit. And then nine years after he dies, the Bridgeport 
newspaper still misses him. And I know you can't read this. And we're going to end on this note. Because you can't say he didn't know how to have fun. Again, grain of salt here. So the story here, this tale has to do with McTarnahan. McTarnahan, the sledgehammer orator. Do you remember him? Contract, miner, woodman, and teamster. Perhaps you were not in this section or forgotten when he essayed to win the golden grains from the sands at Dogtown and Old Mono. Such was his venture and his profits. If profits there were, are both unknown to us. Of such is not this tale, but of McTarnahan's slide. It was a warm day in 82 when McTarnahan, with a few companions, started out on a prospecting trip over the hill and up along the cinnamon cut, looking for placers. He was dressed in those corduroys. Mac, without corduroys, was not Mac at all. His favorites tucked into his heavy boots, and he was ready for sunshine or squall. Thus was he attired when on his return with his companions, just as the sun went down, they reached the summit of the mountain where the Mono Lake Trail crosses the divide. Mac toted his gold pan and pick, the companions of many a year, and as he stood for a moment on the summit, a glorious thought became master of his being. Why not slide down the hill in the gold pan? The crust was hard, the pan was smooth. Why not, to be sure, and the corduroys were planted firmly in the pan. With his pick for a rudder, and with a ringing cheer, he started down the hill. Down, down the hill, dashed the miner laden pan, gaining speed at every moment. Soon, all efforts to steer were in vain, and the pan began to circle and slide and turn. First, Mac would have one leg in the air, then the other, then both. He was striving with might in Maine to anchor himself with the pick, but every effort only increased his speed. Soon, another foe entered into the contest, friction. The pan began to warm from its rapid journey, warmer and warmer, hot, hotter, hottest. Those corduroys were damp from the long trip in the snow and soon began to steam and then to smoke. Hotter grew the pan, likewise the corduroys. As jumping, turning, sliding, and smoking dashed the laden pan. Louder, shriller, and more heartrending came the cries of McTarnahan to the ears of the watchers on the hill above. Could he free himself? Not much. Did you ever wear damp corduroys and have them suddenly become warm? Why, they stuck to that pan like a porous plaster while McTarnahan sailed on. All journeys come to end, so did Max. And as the pan came to a halt at the foot of the hill, he gained his feet and rushed to the stream where for a moment he was lost to sight in a cloud of steam. And thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't know all the answers, though. I'm so glad you asked that because I counted it up today. I said, you know, someone's going to ask that. And I just separated all my pages, but I have it written here somewhere. Well, I'm not finding it right now, but I think I have it memorized. It's uh, 13 children total, four who died very young. Yes, three different moms. No, the, the uh, one, the third wife um, only lived a year, and she was 52, so he didn't have any children with her. I have a feeling he was looking for a babysitter. Remember, seven children at that point who were still at home? He is buried in Sonora. Oh, I guess that, yeah, I guess that's blocking it, yeah. Uh, he's buried in Sonora, and you can find him on Find a Grave, yeah, and April 20th, 1895. And uh, he's got a lot of descendants. I've kind of checked the listings of some genealogy sites I went to. It doesn't look like any of his children are still living. The last one died in 1981. The youngest one, I believe. And not that I could find. And 
I've been through the 1880 census, and I'm not sure that he was ever living there. I think people that wrote about him just assumed, you know, maybe he was living in Bridgeport and went to Bodie a lot. I, I've never spotted him on the census. I could be wrong. Maybe they misspelled his name or missed him. More likely, I don't think he lived there. Okay, do you want to read the chat questions or? Questions, but okay. there are a lot of accolades here. Oh, okay. the uh, the recording will show up sometime tomorrow morning on the Mono Basin Historical Society website. I thought I saw a question about. Do you think he did away with his wives? Whoa! There. Do you think he may have done away with his wives intentionally or not? Uh, you know, uh, in, in those, in those, yeah, it, in those days, I think having children under the conditions, um, I think that would wear a woman out. Um, yeah, a lot of women died in childbirth or shortly thereafter. There's a couple of different women that I've written about in Bodhi that um, died like nine months, you know, like they got sick and they never recovered. And can you hear me on snowshoes? Yes, um, question about the snowshoes. Yes, it's what we now call skis, they, but in, in those days they called them snowshoes. But yeah, they were skis. Uh, yeah, maybe. Things talking about how they couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. okay, all right. What does is, what is Steve say there? Noted that Bodhi was at the height of his boom during that time there. Can you slide that down a bit? Oh, oh, stop, stop. Yeah, stop right there. Yes, Bodhi was at the height of his boom there. And the picture that you saw in there is uh, from the Merriam Library by a man named R.E. Wood, who took some huge, big uh, negatives of Bodhi, you know, big film and a view camera. And that's why his pictures are so incredibly clear. And they're wonderful pictures. And he was there in 1879. Yes, that's when that picture is from. This picture is actually from, and I tried to find out who owned the rights to it. And the people that print the uh, Frank Weddert's book of Bodie 1859, 1900 had this. And I went down and talked to the printer and they were like, well, yeah, you can use it. Um, you know, I don't think anybody owns it. And uh, I said, well, could I get a cleaner copy that I don't have to steal out of the book? And they said, oh, okay, we'll call you. And, they didn't. So I, you know, through the wonders of photoshopping, I managed to get it to look pretty decent. What? Uh, McTarnahan, the actual portrait of him. Oh, yes. And uh, this is the same map we, map we saw at the beginning. And uh, it's an older map I found, um, McTarnahan Bridge. You saw the pictures over there on the left, right under Mr. McTarnahan's portrait. And then McTarnahan Hill is over there to the east. There is. I'm thinking of trying it myself next summer, maybe. Okay, any more questions on there? Okay. With that, thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm wondering how that railroad ride would be <laughs> on Sonora. <laughs> ah, Ellen was just asking that she was wondering if he keeps got if he kept getting run out of town, and maybe that's why he popped around a lot. Okay, well it's time for the door prize. So I. I, for the folks that are here, I put uh, numbers to their names, and number three is Kathy Foy. Woo! So Kathy Foy wins a Dave Carl book. <laughs> so any of you that are in Lee Mining and you have decided to stay home in your jammies, 
and, and Santiago was just called out. Uh, you might want to come next month and uh, and get a door prize. You just never know. And uh, if you'd like to enjoy a yummy meal, you can bring something for a potluck. And if you don't want to eat, says, just come on down anyway. I think they did the clap. Thing. So that's the end of our meeting this evening. And thank you all for joining. And as Rich said, we'll have the recording up. What do you think? Mid morning. I don't think Rich sleeps. So, so he'll have it up mid morning. So thank you all so very much for attending, and we'll see you next month. And next month will be the Lundy talk by uh, Linda Lapierre. Oh, thank you so much.